Hello everyone, welcome to the stream. If you're watching live, thanks for dropping in. Or if you're watching this video on demand, thanks for checking out the archive. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel and catch me the next time I stream live. So hello to everyone. Welcome uh, to the first stream. Not only of the new year, uh, but also my first ever stream on YouTube. Um, now, I have been streaming in the past, just never on YouTube before, so um, bear that in mind. Fingers crossed everything will go well. Uh, things are a little bit different, settings and all of the technical stuff is uh, a little bit different here on YouTube, So, uh, but I think I've got it figured out. Um, but nevertheless, uh, if uh, my microphone is too loud uh, or too quiet, or the music is too loud or too quiet, do let me know. Um, if there are any issues, um, then uh, yeah, let me know and hopefully I'll be able to do something about it. Uh, if not, then I can always fix it for the next time. So, um, I hope everyone is having a good uh, New Year's Day so far. Um, it is currently half past ten in the evening in the UK um, and it's been pouring with rain all day, so um, not exactly the most... Uh, um, welcoming uh, first day of the of the year, but uh, oh well, we shall uh, crash on and hope hope everything will get better from here. Um, so I thought um, for the first stream I would um, do something relatively simple. Anatomy is never simple, but uh, I thought I would do something fairly um, something I was uh, a little bit more. Um, used to let's say so I thought I would do some hands um, just to get things started uh, get into the the groove of live streaming again um, and uh, yeah we'll see how it goes see how it works on on YouTube and um, we'll go from there really so I do have a reference for this and I've done a little sketch as you can see it's just um just a black and black and white um, sketch. Uh, black rather, sorry. Um, just on a sort of like a blue background. I can turn it off. See, it's just a sort of dappled uh, oil paint canvasy sort of backdrop. And I've chosen uh, blue uh, because the flesh tone is going to be like Caucasian. So it's going to be sort of white and pink and, and uh, with a, a shadow of sort of green yellow. So I thought the blue would would complement that nicely. So we'll just jump in really. Um, and fingers crossed everything will go as intended. So usually the first thing I do is to find where the shadows are. Um, and uh, figure out the sort of the darker tones um, to kind of start building some structure. But before I do that, I think I need to sign in chat. So I'm just going to press a button and see what happens. Something I forgot to do earlier. Yeah, my streaming software was just flagging um, a notification saying you need to sign in to be able to chat. Um, and I just wondered if I wasn't going to be able to see anyone's comment. There we go. Hi, Wad. Welcome. That's good. I can see your message. Cool, okay, so as I was saying, um, I normally start by just blocking in the shadows, really, and finding those darker tones. So we will make a start. And also I start by zooming out. 
because I want to see a sort of an overview of the whole image really at this stage. Just so I can get the the structure together and and then later on I'll I'll zoom in and do some more detailed work. For now, uh, big shapes, big brushes, and dark shadows, and a bit of mid-tone as well. Anyone's got any questions at all? Let me know. I was thinking before the stream how I should go about painting this and I, I did wonder whether I should focus on one hand specifically and uh, then move on to the other one but I decided I might as well just work on both of them at the same time That's what I would normally do, but I just wondered whether working on one of the hands would perhaps allow me to get a little bit further in the process and, uh, you know, showcase a little bit more refinement. Um, because I probably won't get all of this done in one stream, you see, so I was planning on doing about two in this little mini series but I thought it would be uh, more representative of my normal paint method if I just worked on all of it in one go and Hi Elijah, how are the brushes treating you? I hope they're working for you. Oh, you want to see my workspace? I can't do that right now because that would require me to completely change the setup, um, which would take a little while. But uh, I will either showcase that maybe on social media or I'll adjust it a little bit um, for next time. But right now I'm just using the smooth round <laughs> already a lot of shadows yeah yeah we've got some underlighting as well it's, the, the light's coming from the top we've got like a, a a warm light coming from the right and then there's a slightly cool light coming from the left from above and uh then you've got the sort of shadows in the mid section and then a little bit of bounced ambient light underneath and it all makes sense I promise a little bit further 
into the stream. But as with all things like this, it always tends to look like a mess to begin with. But you've got to start somewhere. And uh, also you're not always, well, I find anyway, I'm not always fully <laughs> aware how things are going to go until much further through the process. Unfortunately, I'm not one of those artists that has like a, you know, 2020 vision um, and can imagine the finished painting sort of in my, in my mind before I've even begun. There are some artists like that out there. <laughs> um, I'm very jealous. But usually I have a very vague idea of what I want to to go with. Um especially when it's a more complicated image. Um <laughs> the more vague it is, to be honest. I normally get inspired by photography. Um, landscapes, costumes, um, things from history and culture and all that kind of stuff that will just plant a little little seed of an idea in my head and also a tone, like an atmosphere or a, or a, a feeling, an emotion maybe. And uh, I'll start to kind of connect the dots, so it, as it were, and and of course other people's artwork, other other artwork. And I think, hmm, maybe doing something inspired by whatever I've seen other artists do and then spin it into something that is completely my own, of course. But uh, usually whenever I'm inspired by something, regardless of where it's come from, it's always like the the, the first point, really. It gets, gets me started and the final image tends to drift quite away from the initial idea. Not in a bad way, it just develops and um, like I say, it, where it starts off quite blurry, as I work my way through it gets more and more refined and I get a clearer idea of where the artwork's going, that sort of thing, which I think is fairly common. underside will probably look quite dark um, in the outset because the plan is to layer the paint up and and brighten it up a little bit Oh, it's good. I'm glad the brushes are working for you. The reason I ask or question it is that it, brushes don't work for everyone. I've had plenty of um, brushes in my collection that I've bought from other artists or, or downloaded from different places over the years, and 
certain artists will swear by them and say these are the best ever and but uh, then they don't always work for me um, so it's kind of like fi finding a pair of shoes that fit um, sometimes it takes a while <laughs> to find the right size to find the right fit for you and something that might fit someone else might not always suit you so but I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that they're working all right for you like with anything really any new art program or new brush set or whatever it might be or new style it takes a while to figure it all out and get used to something new um do I prefer Photoshop or Procreate? Um, I have used Photoshop pretty much exclusively for at least 15 years, which is the length of my professional career. Um, and actually, to be to be fair, I um, I learned to use Photoshop after I graduated, which was 15, 16 years ago. So. Um, I kind of stuck with it, really. Um, that's not to say it's the best program. Um, there have been obviously much more uh, art programs that have come out since then. That's the other thing, you know, there weren't as many Uh, art programs available back when I started to learn how to paint digitally so um, and that doesn't mean you can't change um, but I I never really found the need to um, mainly because I find that the UI and just the workflow on Photoshop to be easier for me again personal preference um, I just found maybe it's because I'm, I'm used to used to it um, but uh, I just find that I can create artwork quicker with Photoshop than anything else um, with Procreate I have dabbled with it because uh, I had to, when I was making my brushes, I wanted to make sure that they would work on Procreate, so I um, I used my iPad to uh, import my brushes across from Photoshop into Procreate and then adjusted all the, the settings in Procreate so that they, uh, they're custom built for Procreate as well. Um, Uh, that said, my iPad isn't isn't particularly powerful, so I find that Procreate can be a little bit sluggish, a little bit slow, and it's also not the biggest iPad either. So um, I'm used to using quite a big graphics tablet. Um, it's a uh, it's a Huion Canvas Pro 24, so it's quite big. Um, so I'm used to having a lot of real real estate when I'm working and uh, using a small iPad that's a bit slow wasn't really kind of it's not giving me the best impression of Procreate uh, so um, I would Im imagine that any any cons that I have with Procreate are probably because I just need a more powerful um, iPad really um, Uh, that, that said, the UI on Procreate, I don't find it as um, thorough. And obviously it can get a little bit cluttered as well. So, um, so far I've stuck with, with um, Photoshop. However, there, there is a new program that well, I say a new program, a program that I've started to kind of look into 
uh, called Rebel. Uh, spelled R E B E L L E. Um, which is uh, a very uh, realistic uh, painting tool that emulates um, natural, traditional media extremely well. So much as it will emulate paint running down the canvas. So if you uh, you can add water to your paint and it will physically run down. You can even tilt tilt the canvas and it will make the droplets run in different directions. And uh, it's also got a like a, a height map, I guess. So you've you've got you can create very thick. Um, textures paint as well. So I've been investigating that. Um, whether it will again completely ch uh, take over from Photoshop for me, I don't know. It's early days, really. But it might become a tool that I use as part of the process. Maybe like the finishing touches might be quite nice to use to get some stronger impasto brush strokes. Um, but again, I don't find the the UI or the the tool, the layout of all the tools and stuff to be as nice as Photoshop. Um, again, personal preference. But the one pro it does have is that it's uh, you can buy it once and you can own it forever. There's no subscription fee. Whereas obviously Photoshop uh, switched to a um, subscription fee some years ago now. I can't remember quite how far back it was, but um, and some people had an issue with that. Um, I particularly personally didn't necessarily because I use it every day so um, it didn't seem like it was as negative an impact for me but I can see why that would be frustrating um, but Rebel as I say is just buy it once and then you've you've got it forever so um, and there's also a demo as well so if you want to try out a demo just uh, you know, type in rebel art program r-e-b-e-l-l-e -E. try good fun Have I tried other brush packs? Um, I don't think I've tried any of the ones you've listed there. Um, to be honest, I a little bit like I was saying earlier, where I they didn't always suit me. I, I kind of got frustrated that I couldn't find brushes that were perfect for me. And uh, that's no, that's not a criticism for other people's brushes. It's just that I just couldn't get on with them as well as I'd like. Uh, so I kind of resorted to making my own. Um, it was uh, in the middle of COVID, I think. So 2000 and 2001, that sort of thing, around then that I decided to kind of dabble with making my own brushes and I started off with the uh, drawing essentials 
which originally was um, charcoal and pastel. But uh, I'm expanding it into something to include pencil and uh, ink and oil pastel as well. That's exclusive information, but I've been working on it um, for some time. But they will be out at some point. Hopefully some point this year, but uh, that would be nice. Um, so yeah, I started with the sort of oil and pastel brushes originally. Sorry, uh, charcoal and pastel brushes back in 2001. And then the following year I sort of branched out into doing oil and acrylic. Which then turned into the um, painting essentials brush pack. And uh, yeah, they all started out off as like 25 brushes each. <laughs> 25 50 brushes each and then they just they've grown they've expanded um each one has a hundred brushes now um but i um i learned a lot that was another positive of making my own brushes I learned a lot about how to make them or how to use them and how to get the most the best out of them um, and how to make them do what I wanted them to do for me so that was definitely um, a positive to to making my own, learning more about how to make a shop work for me. But uh, I'm always on the lookout for other brushes. Always good to be inspired by other people's brushes to uh, pay attention to what people are buying, what they are interested in you know, from a purely business point of view, but but also to uh, try them out So everything is very kind of smooth and blended out at the moment. That's okay because that's what we want. We want it to be soft, particularly we're, we're talking about skin. So, and it's a fairly sort of young skin type we've got here. So. So that's fine. And we've got a more kind of oily, blended uh, effect. But we will be, uh, once we sort of zoom in and start doing some more detail, we will be using some thicker paint and uh, start getting some more texture going on. Try not to blend too much either. Um, I 
I find that with painting uh, digitally, and traditionally I guess, it applies to both, I find the better results, at least for me, is that when you try and when you don't try to make it look too realistic, when you don't try and smooth everything out, um, I try to remind myself to celebrate the fact that it's hand drawn, um, which means that you're you're allowed to leave texture in, you're allowed to have the, leave the characteristics of paint and bristle marks and texture. That's okay. You don't have to blend it all out. You can you can leave it, and it will add character to your work. Don't think that blending something smoothly equates to better realism. Better realism is achieved through better tonal value and realistic colour, more precise, more accurate colour selection and lighting. So focus on your lighting and focus on your tonal and your colour choices before you start adding tiny details and refining you know little little wrinkles and freckles on the skin and, and skin pores aren't going to make your work look realistic if the colours and the tonal values and the structure of the anatomy is wrong underneath it it's not easy But then, if it were easy, we wouldn't be doing it, would we? <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Matt. Welcome, thank you very much for, for dropping in. Yeah, I mean... Like I said at the beginning, uh, I've streamed before, just never on YouTube. And uh, I thought, you know what? Let's give it a try. It's a new year. Try something new. YouTube is a different audience as well. I, I find that YouTube has probably got a, a, a wider age range and a wider um, cross-section of, of interests sort of thing. So maybe that would be beneficial in some way. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mention the <laughs> the opposition, the, the other website that I was streaming on, but I'm, I'm sure you can, can guess what that was. Um, but uh, let's just, just say that they are known for uh, live streaming video games rather than artwork. So, you know, fewer people over there compared to YouTube. So. Plus, in fact, I've uh, I've got more people following me here on YouTube, which is. You know, for my my ordinary videos, so I thought, you know what? Why don't I do something for you? <laughs> and uh, you know, keep it all keep it here, and see if it works. starting to come together now with the the colours. Um, let's um, bring some of the darker tones in here 
sort of mid-tones before I get too carried away with that other hand. One of the uh, things that drew me to this particular reference and pose was the fact that you've got this really nice shadow of the the upper hand being cast around the wrist or the forearm of the lower arm and uh, it gives a really strong sense of distance between the two the two arms Adding sort of interaction like that is always a, a quite a strong, um, a good idea. With your artwork. You imagine like a piece of artwork with two characters. Um, it's going to be a stronger piece of artwork if they're interacting with each other in some way. Because it starts to, in that case, it starts to, to add a story, a, a bit of narrative. You start to wonder um, their relationship with each other and whether they like each other and what they're talking about, all that sort of thing. And it's kind of the same with this. You know, these having the, the shadows of, of one hand cast on onto the other sort of ties the two together and it's an interaction, a certain type of interaction. Um, and they are affecting each other so that immediately starts to make it more interesting to look at to build some of the mid-tones now. Eventually, some of the uh, you'll see the, the sort of the warmth of the subsurface scattering seem to come through. So, like I mentioned earlier, we've got a, a warm light coming from the right, and I haven't really got to that bit yet um, because I'm working from the sort of the darks and coming up through the midtone. So, uh, the highlights will be one of the last things I do. Um, but uh, we're sort of getting to that point now where some of those mid-tone reds are going to start coming through into the skin. Which will bring it to life a little bit more.
But yeah, another reason why I liked this uh, reference was um, the balance of the colour. The sort of colder blue-green on the shadow side and then the warmth of the oranges. Shining through. And uh, and then sort of a, a sort of a somewhat cool light on the top. Which uh, as I say will come through stronger a little bit later. There's always that that desire to kind of rush ahead and try and do all of the like the cool things first. But you kind of have to resist that urge <laughs> and uh, build it up methodically. Because uh, kind of what I'm trying to do is build things up in a traditional art flavour and uh, if you are a traditional painter usually you start as I say with the shadows first and the darker tones and you build up through the mid tones and then you get to the highlights and uh, your shadows tend to be thinner so the paint physically is thinner uh, it's sort of you water it down either with water or uh, turpentine, it's oil paint, or some kind of medium. And uh, so the, the darker the paint, the thinner it is. And then you, as you build up through your mid-tones, it, things get lighter and your thickest paint is actually your highlights uh, if you've ever seen a traditional painting where the the highlights are quite texturous because the artist has used a very a thick consistency to capture all of that and uh, one of the reasons for doing that is because it creates depth. Obviously, something that's light and bright tends to be closest to you. Um, and so they, they employ that thickness of paint to actually physically build the paint towards you, to, towards the viewer. So it makes sense that the, the higher points, the lightest points, would be thicker and taller and have more depth to them than, uh, and the, the shadows would recede with thinner paint. So I'm kind of trying to emulate that somewhat with digital. Not because you have to, but just because I like it. Hi, Happy New Year. Welcome. I hope everyone is doing well so far. Has anyone painted anything yet? Have you drawn anything? Or are you all recovering from hangovers? So I really want to get that nice sort of burnt orange in the shadows.
the fact that I've zoomed out is uh, forcing me to not get too fiddly too quickly. Um, again, it's kind of resisting the urge to to do all of like the the folds in the skin. I will get there, but uh, now isn't the time for that. I need to stay, stay focused on uh, locking in as many of the colour tones and you know, tones and colours, figuring out some of the saturation and everything. And looking at the image as a whole before I start zooming in, because the thing is, if you zoom in, you you, you obviously lose perspective of everything else. Um, it can be very, very easy to to do so. So. It's better to keep things zoomed out as much as you can. <laughs> you got sidetracked. I apologise. Yeah, I haven't streamed um, for over a year, which was not the intention. I just like to add. But uh, got busy with other things. Save my work. Pro tip: remember to save your work, or it uh, before Photoshop collapses and you lose your work. I may be painting over my sketch, but I do have, it is on a separate, separate layer, so all of the paintwork that I've done is on a separate layer, so I will be able to um, check on my sketch and make sure that uh, everything is in the right place. I'll probably do that a little bit later. There you go. I don't think that all my sketch is kind of disappearing and gone forever. We're starting to get somewhere, so uh, finally, but uh, after an hour, an hour in, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. You know, you've got to start somewhere, and it normally ends up looking quite messy. Which can be a little bit off-putting, <laughs> to say the least. I think this is going to work, or am I just going to mess it up? But, uh, you know, you have to kind of trust the process, really, don't you? Okay. 
keep chipping away at it. And then once you've got some paint actually on the, the canvas, you can sort of see it's just a little bit easier to kind of figure out what you need to do next. Let's just uh, block in that finger here. Otherwise I can see, see myself forgetting it and moving on to the other hand. Having that blue undertone is also helping because, like I mentioned, the shadows are sort of a greenish tone, so the blue kind of plays into that. I uh, personally always kind of pick a, a, a canvas colour or a background colour that's going to complement the shadow and help the shadow. Um, because then you can build, like I say, you can build the light uh, out of that. Rather than going with like a an orange background a warm background, it um, you wouldn't work quite so well. I mean, you can do anything, of course, do whatever you want, but it might be a little bit quicker this way, or Find whatever method works best for you, really. What's my re resolution for this year? I don't normally keep resolutions, to be honest. Um, but uh, trying to create more artwork, I imagine, <laughs> and figure out the enigma that is social media. Um, Probably not the most exciting resolution.
Oh, you'd like a stream about uh, brush making? Um, that's definitely a potential thing I could do if uh, if some of you would be interested in that. Um, I forgot to say, if anyone's got any ideas about what you would like to see uh, me live stream and paint um, or create or whatever, whether it's subject matter or like you say, whether it's a, a sketch stream or a painting stream or a brush making stream, um, that's definitely something that I was considering actually. Um, in which I would actually make brushes live. <laughs> um, it can be a bit messy though, that's the thing. Because it's basically just me throwing paint around. But, uh, I probably have to figure out a second camera setup. But, uh, yeah, that was on my, like, to-do list or potential um, ideas list. So I think that would be actually be interesting to watch. But uh, I think when when I uh, make all the swatches for all of the brushes that I make, um, I actually uh, I number them all. All of the swatches I, n I number them all sequentially. So regardless of what brush set they end up in, it's always you know one to whatever. And I recently went past seven hundred. So. Um, there are 700 uh, swatches um, currently filling my studio um, and it's got to the point now where it's kind of overflowing and I'm being taken over by swatches, pieces of, of card and paper and canvas with paint and charcoal and ink and pencil and all over them uh, <laughs> being overrun like here's some literally right here right, move this uh, what can I show you Some here. These ones are stipples and dapples, obviously. Um, what have I got in here? Oh, it's some, some oil pastel. Again, some kind of Stiffly sort of uh, effects, but then I also have um, that was a nice one. That one is that one's an ink bloom, which is you know putting water on on a piece of card and then dripping ink into it and it splays out. These are actually full of different samples. Um, more in here. Um, I posted some on my Threads account actually, you might want to have a look. But it's good fun to, to make brushes, I, it's kind of an, an addiction if I'm, if I'm honest. Um. Oh here's some, here's some runny, runny ink ones. Try not to cover the microphone with. Uh, what have we got in here. These are all black and white, by the way, so you're not missing out on anything. Uh, 
Hold on. So, they don't all become like a single brush. I kind of, I scan them into the computer and then kind of cut and paste bits together. So, I would say that I probably do about five swatches for every brush that I make um, because I kind of compile them into like a single brush. Um, so, like, I'll easily do like 30 swatches and then make five brushes from it. Here's something a little bit of a teaser. What could that be? Those are on their way at some point. For those of you who don't know, that was a uh, gold leaf. Anyway, back to painting. But uh, yeah, um, I would definitely consider doing a stream where I make brushes. All personal pieces. Uh, yes, I've been working on uh, a rather large <laughs> personal painting. Um, uh, fun fact, it started this time last year. Um, actually, you can tell a lie. It, it's a painting that I've been wanting to do for quite some time, and I painted it several times and then painted it and uh, got rid of it um, and started again and again and again um, but uh, this particular iteration of this painting uh, started this time last year so I didn't work on it all year I kind of got back to it around September time I would say and started uh, making some real progress on it But I'm not ready to um, to share it anymore. I would have streamed it, but it's too big and it's too complicated, <laughs> and I just I just needed some time to make my brushes, figure out what I wanted to do, and uh, just have some time to quietly work on a personal painting. Uh, without people watching. Um. So, um. but yeah, hopefully I will make some more progress on that soon and uh, I'll be able to showcase it. I have been saving the progress as well, so I'll be able to kind of share, you know, step by step, sort of behind the scenes, you know, content. But if all goes well, I've got an extremely busy year ahead. Um, commission wise which is great news for me <laughs> uh, one of which well pretty much most of them I can't actually divulge any details about them at all I'm contractual contractually uh, restricted <laughs> from being able to talk about it uh, but um it was, it's, let's say, it's the biggest commission I've ever had um, from the biggest client that I've ever had. And it com came completely out of the blue um, in March last year. 
and uh, the the client was interested in the personal painting that I'd created. Uh, someone mentioned that um, it was a a knight painting, as in a, a swordsman, swordsman knight, which I did on on a previous live stream. Um, and I did that for a personal piece to experiment, to push my skills, hopefully, and uh, that kind of thing. And um, cut to six months later, a client, completely out of the blue, said, we like this painting and we want you to work on a project with us. So, you know, it just goes to show, sometimes you think that, oh, working on this personal piece is pointless, or it's, it's not going to get anywhere, what am I doing this for? But it can be that that very painting that, you know, kickstarts or launches you into a completely, you know, new commission or project later on down the line. So I would say that, you know, I've got <laughs> proof that uh, working on a passion project is never wasted time because you never know who is watching. And uh, you never know who that uh, might be interested in it. So, you know, always make time for personal work and passion pieces and Because uh, yeah, it could be uh, could be the key to unlocking the next stage. Um, and I mentioned that that was back in March, and I've kind of been doing work for them on and off. And uh, the sort of main project hasn't started yet, but it's due to begin this year. So. But I've got some other projects as well, some other commissions as well that I'm going to be juggling, attempting to juggle. Um, all of which kind of turned up in oh, through December. They all kind of just flooded my inbox <laughs> with uh, commission inquiries, and naturally, I wanted to do all of them because they were all good. I thought, oh. They all turn up all in one go. <laughs> but I'm not complaining. Let's move on to this second hand here. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I was uh, very excited when I got that commission email. So much so that I actually thought it was a fake. Thought it was a scam. <laughs> it's like there is no way that you want. There's no way that you want to hire me. <laughs> this isn't real. Um, but uh, it was. So. But yeah, like, like I say, I've been doing this for 15 years and uh, goes to show you know stick with it sometimes it can take a while but if you're devoted to it it'll happen Yeah, the commissions are all booked. I'm basically booked up through to all till August. So panic? <laughs> no.
but uh, yeah, hopefully they'll all come through to fruition. Sometimes, you know, people cancel and you know, change their mind and that sort of thing. Fingers crossed. Uh, let's check that I haven't missed any. Do I have any techniques to get relaxed into drawing, painting without hitting an artist block? Um, I guess I'm. I'm in music mainly. I I have um quite a few Spotify um, playlists that I've made. Um, in fact, if you uh. Search. I don't know if I can put it in the chat. Actually, I might be able to. Uh, let me just. Uh, can I click on that? Oh, copy link to profile. I think this is going to work. Uh, I'm guessing you can post link. Um. That's my Spotify profile. Um, if anyone's interested in uh, the music that plays in my um, live streams and that sort of thing, um, then um, have a look. I think I've got sort of. Th I think there are three public playlists on there. One of them is loads of uh, video game music and movie music and. Uh, that sort of stuff, and then there's more of a an ambient environment sort of flavor where it's a bit more kind of atmospheric uh, and less less well known music. Like you're not going to get any kind of music from uh, film or that sort of thing. Um, and there's a few video game music pieces in there, but mostly it's from like more obscure composers, like indie composers, that sort of thing. And it's all designed to kind of emulate or create like a, a, a mood or a tone. Um, it's mainly like medieval and mythology and that sort of fantasy type ambient music. Um, something that kind of helps me imagine the little world in my head. Uh, and the other one is, uh, uh, like, I've just started that one, that's more of a science fiction one, which is a little bit more kind of light, uh, it's louder, uh, more aggressive. <laughs> um, but uh, that's coming together well as well. But yeah, it's, an, it's another addiction of mine, it's, is um, making huge playlists on Spotify, because each one is probably... One of them has got over a thousand songs in it. The other one is nearing a thousand. Uh, and the third one is only got maybe like a hundred in it, something like that. But it'll get there. But uh, yeah, I, I generally just listen to sort of music whilst I'm working to kind of get me in the zone. Um, and Pinterest as well. Looking at uh, stuff on Pinterest and making making boards on, on Pinterest and for inspiration and then uh, you know if you've got artist block or you know just need inspiration you can then look at all your your, your boards that you've made on Pinterest and uh, something will jump out at you and you go oh that's an idea I mean there's there's been stuff on that I've had pinned on Pinterest for years and years that I, I liked at the time and thought that would be interesting or you know some kind of inspiration for a painting or part of a painting at some point and it's been sitting there for, for years and then one day you know you'll you'll see it and go that's perfect for whatever I need at that moment 
so uh, I like hoarding. <laughs> I like hoarding uh, references and inspirational stuff. <laughs> Pineapple Man, wow, okay. Wrong chat. I I would I would argue it's probably the right chat, frankly. Decomposes. <laughs> That's one of the great things of like the recent internet is that you know freelancers or. or People, just ordinary people can just make stuff and you know build a business build a a following build you know their dream their dream job from it and uh, a lot of those indie composers are you know people that you know back in the day started adding sort of music tracks on YouTube and that sort of thing and now the the licensing has kind of caught up and there are now you know uh, like with Spotify um, or um, various other ones, websites that allow you to, you know, subscribe and you get access to loads of license, uh, licensed music and that sort of thing uh, for streaming and all that kind of stuff. Um, all of these indie composers are now uploading their music that they've been working on for years and years, and uh, they're able to sort of get some money for it finally and or or they they've got a patreon and that sort of thing but none of that stuff kind of existed when they were starting out but now the internet is like i say caught up to all of that and finally um you know they're able to kind of live the dream as it were um living the dream in a very modest way which is all you really need really isn't it frankly <laughs> absolutely well there's something there's something addicting again uh, to the challenge of building your own your own thing, whatever it is. But then, I've always been a creative person, so I've always been interested in you know creating stuff. So I, I guess the idea of kind of building my own. You know, illustration business wasn't too much of a stretch um, or attempting to anyway but uh, yeah the fact that we can the fact that the idea of going freelance is more achievable now than, than it's ever been is great What are we actually doing? Getting distracted. It's a trouble. If I get distracted, I start to like go wandering. And I'm not as methodical as I should be. Uh, it's not a not a big deal really, but maybe it's easier to watch if I'm try and keep something uh, as structured, more structured as uh, possible, rather than my usual. 
method of just uh, painting anywhere and everything. Uh, the necromancer piece. Oh, uh, do you mean the one that I did on um, live stream several years ago now? Um, I'm assuming this. That's the one you're talking about. Uh, wow, well, I kind of lost track of how long that took. Too long was the answer to that question. Um. But uh, I forget if you. Um, I mean, I live streamed most of it, didn't I? So I can't remember how many live streams there were in that series. I want. I want to say like thirty. I must have been streaming that for like a good six months, which was a bit of a nightmare, frankly, because I didn't realise it was going to go on for that long. It was an example of a painting that that grew and grew, um, and uh, just kind of turned him into a monster, really. But it was actually that painting that inspired me to try again, basically, with with the same character in a different different scene. Um, because I wasn't happy with it. I felt it got too uh, too refined, too detailed, and not as painterly as I wanted it to be. I don't dislike it, uh, but um, it was supposed to, at the time it was supposed to be uh, a way that I could try something new and, and change my style. But it kind of uh, the more it went on, the more it kind of ended up regressing back into what I'd already always done um, which was a bit disappointing it was I described it once as it was supposed to be the next page in a new chapter what it ended up being was the last page in the old chapter so so yeah not not a huge disappointment, but it wasn't what I had hoped it would was going to be. But you know, you win some, you lose some, and uh, it's still you know an, an effective piece, and I still have it on my website and use it. But um, it's definitely I've left it there also because it's a good reminder to me to say you know don't get carried away. <laughs> um, So, uh, yeah, and, and making my own brushes was part of that as well, you know, to develop a new style or way of working. Yeah, it did. Um, it did have uh, warm colours originally. But that was another example of me not planning my work well enough. But uh, it's, not, it's you know, not the end of the world, but... Uh, it was frustrating, particularly because I was doing it on live stream as well. Because when I live stream something, I like to have everything planned and figured out before, uh, so that it keeps it as concise as possible. Particularly on a large project like that, I tried to 
you know, do a sketch and, and fully reference everything so that I knew what was sort of next on the agenda sort of thing so I, I wouldn't sort of flail about and waste time but uh, despite the planning that I did do it wasn't enough unfortunately and uh, I did end up kind of changing the composition and the, and the colours somewhat But, uh, you know, I should have known better because I've been uh, doing this for some time now, so <laughs> I should have known better to to plan my work better. But some more of red pink in the skin here we're just kind of turning the corner on that edge of the hand and it, it's moving from the cold cold shadows and uh, into the sort of more orange that's hitting the uh, the orange light that's hitting the palm of the hand which I haven't painted yet But uh, the orange light is much more apparent on the the upturned hand. Another uh, reason for choosing to do hands for this live stream is because I've been doing a lot of hands recently. Um, so I, to do with the practice. Do I use thumbnails? No, I don't. Um, I tend to think. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I tend to think a lot and imagine it in my head and get a vague idea and search for references and then kind of figure it out in the sketch phase I um 
yeah, I, I kind of think of the potential sort of compositions, different options, and then make a decision in my own head. I don't immediately go to, you know, uh, drawing. Some people do, and there's no reason why you shouldn't do that. But I've never been a, someone who fills sketchbooks, much to my art teacher's uh, frustration uh, back in the day when I was at school and uni and stuff. Uh, which is actually something that I would quite like to do actually, to actually fill the sketchbook, to actually draw and sketch and, and stuff, but I just... The idea of it, I think, is more appealing to me than actually doing it. Which sounds really weird, doesn't it? But I just like to get on with it <laughs> um, and kind of figure it out as I go and... Um, do all of my planning Uh, on the actual image itself rather than do lots of little drawings and separate drawings, you know, that sort of thing. I tend to just do it all in, one, all in the one file, all in the one image. That could well be a bad habit, so don't <laughs> don't consider that as a, like a as advice or, or a, something to follow. If I did do more sketches and thumbnails, I'd certainly have more to post on social media, so... But, uh... My brain doesn't let me do that. Like, no, you will you will post finished artwork only. Which isn't very helpful, but, you know... And then saying that I'm I'm on live stream painting, you know. So you know, so weird. I didn't I didn't uh, I never had claimed that I made sense. But I'm quite happy to show my work in progress when it's live in front of people. <laughs> I just don't like posting it on social media. Try and make sense of that. Yeah. You can probably see some of the sketch lines are still sort of existing like where I've actually painted you can still see sort of the lines those will all kind of get blended out eventually Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I mean, you can do you can do thumbnails for for figures to to get uh, the flow of movement. 
um, in your pose. But uh, if you're heavily referencing your work, then you probably don't need to do that quite so much because the information is there in the reference. But certainly if, if you're con combining you know, landscape with figures and like the more figures you have in a scene, the, uh, the more useful thumbnailing would become, I imagine. Some people also do colour thumbnails as well, so it's kind of the thumbnailing process is also a, a way of figuring out colours, a general colour scheme before diving in. I find that traditional artists tend to do it more than digital, I believe, because obviously with traditional, if you if you mess up, then you you know you potentially mess up your your canvas or you waste paint that sort of thing. So you know, doing as much planning as you can beforehand is you know helps save money and avoid disaster. But um. With digital, it's so easy to just edit things and change things that I kind of like to do it all in uh, the the one the one go sort of thing. In fact, I I always tweak the colours as I go through a, a whole painting. I'm, all, I'm constantly sort of adjusting them with adjustment layers and that sort of thing, and gradient map, whatever. Uh, even with as much planning as I do now um, I, I never really nail it down I leave it so that I can actually adjust it I think that's kind of important really to remain open to changes And uh, you know, not be afraid to make big changes to to your work, even if it's halfway through or you know something like that. Make the change, especially if it's digital, because obviously you, you don't have to save the changes. <laughs> uh, you can ex you've got the uh, the ability to experiment with it and. push pixels around and and come up with new ideas all the time. Another one of the reasons why I enjoy digital so much is the ability, the, the risk-free sort of uh, feeling that you, you have. Oh, Elijah, well, the the brush menu. I don't actually have that selected. I don't. Uh, I've changed the um, key bindings on the on the pen because I found that annoying. <laughs> uh, to to you know because I I would hit the button accidentally and it would keep popping up with the the brush menu. You can see I also turned off the uh, the sample. Um, the eyedropper sample ring as well. I don't really like sort of UI things that kind of pop up. I find them kind of annoying. Um, particularly when I was live streaming and doing videos as well, like um, uh, you know, time lapse videos. If you're filming and you've constantly got bits of UI popping up, uh, it gets in the way and it can uh, give people eye strain if you're 
you know, trying to watch your video and you've got things zooming around. It's another reason why you haven't seen me move the canvas left or right or zoom in and out all the time. Because if you speed it up, it's then flying around all over the place and uh, you people can't focus on anything because it's, you know, all over the place. So I kind of got into the habit of um, not having any of that stuff. I'm still using the, uh, the smooth round brush. Just so you know. I, I will be using other brushes as well. But the smooth round is a nice brush to lay in all of these soft colours. And then when I get more detailed I'll start using uh, like the point the point brushes and the liners and that sort of thing. But we're almost there. I'm going to zoom in at some point shortly. I'll block in this finger. And uh, then we'll start sort of refining the folds in the skin and, and that sort of stuff and around the nails as well. Uh, yes, Artstation is a great website for reference material. It's gone from strength to strength, really, with all the, the creators on there that are creating photo packs for quite reasonable prices, I have to say. You know, I'm, I'm surprised that they're not more expensive. But uh, I'm glad they're not. <laughs> But yeah, again, me being a hoarder, uh, I, I tend to buy packs that I like and think that's going to be something that I'm going to use in future. And I'll buy it and download it and stash it on my computer. Um, or later use in a painting. Um, yeah, that's another another place that inspiration comes from. Someone might post a really effective uh, art reference pack, and it, that'll be you know, ideal inspiration. Think, oh, that's great. Also, the amount of times that I am wor I'll be working on something, and then someone somewhere will post a. Uh, a reference pack that is perfect for whatever it is that I'm working on or something that I need and I'm like and it just turns up so obviously I, I have to buy it <laughs> and uh, use it so I've been known to buy you know, entire packs of hundreds of photos just for like one photo that's in there that I've seen. Because that, that particular pose and that angle is just perfect for whatever I wanted and I'll buy the whole pack just for that. Um, but uh, they're also pretty versatile as well because you can you can utilise um different elements of, of different packs and combine it all together and you know like for example you can buy a, a a knight swordsman pack and the guy is wearing a, a, a cape or something and you can use that cape reference for doing a sci-fi something you know or a batman picture or whatever it would be um, you know there, it doesn't have to be the picture you create doesn't have to be uh, the same subject matter as the uh, the reference pack. You can always find a variety of uses.
You could also try uh, Cube Brush as well. Cube Brush is uh, a website that's got brushes and uh, reference material. Uh, however, a lot of the reference packs on ArtStation are also on CubeStation as well. Uh, I don't know whether they're cheaper or more expensive. Um, I haven't actually paid that much attention, to be honest. But um, if you don't want to, you don't have a, an art station account or don't want to be on there, then you could try Cubebrush instead. Uh, also, Gumroad, well, have reference back. Um, there's also creative market as well i don't think they have reference packs but they have brushes and fonts and things if they also have, if you're interested in like um product imagery and stuff you're you're going to make products and things then they've got they've got like templates and stuff for that type of stuff on there uh which i've yet to dive into but definitely on my to-do list to have a look at some of that stuff you know if you've got an online shop and you want to make it look fancy you can uh, maybe find some stuff on creative market to help you do that. Uh, speaking of which, I think um, I think this reference that I'm using came from ArtStation at some point. Um, however, it is several references in one, though. Combined different photographs. I like to make my own reference. Um, so uh, I'll collage stuff together to create a reference. Which is quite fun in itself, to be honest. And it really helps you get a good idea of the sort of thing that you're trying to create. So I'm just uh, wanting to get this the colour of this finger because uh, it's got the sort of green shadow and uh, sort of like a purpley pink on this top edge here because it's not being caught by the light in the same way as the other fingers of the hand. So, and it's quite important for the composition to get this right, otherwise the feeling of depth will look odd. So, to make sure that I get this right. Right, let's get that finger in the background there. I'm 
One tip is to use the largest brush for the, the job. So, uh, you know, don't scrub away with small brushes. And you can just use one large brush stroke, which is something I often forget, I will admit. But it is something that I trying to uh, correct That's the first time I've used the undo button in two hours. <laughs> you do not need to use the undo button. <laughs> Just paint over it. Most of the time. Especially if you're you're going for a painterly effect. Just paint over it. Never surrender. <laughs> Do I go to events? Currently I don't. Because they are very expensive. Um, also the majority of them are in America and I'm, I live in the UK so I'd have to factor in a plane fare uh, as well. Uh, however there is one in London which isn't too far away from me. Uh, that would be it. That is a, a comic con. Um, I don't know whether I would do it. I, I've dabbled with the idea. Um, I kind of want to get more personal work done. Because, I feel, like I say, I've started trying to change my style somewhat. And... Uh, do some personal work that I really love before I kind of venture into uh, the world of events. I probably should have done all of this a long time ago, but I kind of got into doing uh, commissions for gaming companies and that sort of thing. And uh, they they own all the work, so I can't sell prints of it. Um, there's very little uh, well, work that I've done that I can actually sell, really, of the stuff that I still like, <laughs> uh, that I would want to sell. But it's definitely on my agenda to correct that and um, maybe do an event at some point 
in the not so distant future. Um, but as far as like going coming to America is concerned, I would have to like make it a holiday. I'd have to uh, you know stay for a prolonged period of time, I would imagine, rather than you know fly out for a weekend and then come back again. I'd But uh, then you hear like the, the horror stories of all of my artwork got delayed or went missing. So, you know, I'd be in America and all of my convention work product would uh, not arrive. <laughs> so, um, because you'd, ha you'd, you'd have to send them on in advance, really. You know, I'm not boarding a plane with all of my artwork. That's not going to happen. I wouldn't, it, they wouldn't let me on. Um, so, uh, I do have a friend in America, so I might have to. Uh, what I could do is order a ton of prints and get them sent to him, and bombard him with all of my uh, uh, convention materials because uh, otherwise it would be ordering prints having them sent to me, and then having them sent to America. You're, you're paying double the, the postage. So... Uh, I'd have to think, think that through. But there are many artists out there who do conventions, and that is their main source of income. Um, you know, they do like five conventions or more, in a year, and that's how they make the majority of their money. That and like an Etsy store and that sort of thing. Um, but then there are plenty of artists who say that they've never earned, they've never got their money back um, from events. They've spent so much on pre preparing everything, and then the flight and the holiday, sorry, the the hotel, the flight and the hotel, uh, and that kind of thing, and and the table because you have to pay for you know, the space, um, and they don't break even, um, but then they might get commissions because they met people at the convention, so, you know, that was a very long way of, long-winded way of me saying I've, I haven't ruled it out. But uh, it would be, it would take a long time to plan to uh, get everything organised. Right, let's just block that fingernail in. It's too light.
Right, I think it's time to actually zoom in. Only two hours into the stream. Checking my camera battery. Yes, let's uh, save the work and then I'll zoom in and uh, start to refine. Some of the details. Save. Another tip is to um, Set one, if you've got a tablet, set a button to save your work. So, um, mine is Control S, obviously, in Photoshop. So, if I were to, if I were to press Control S, then it would save, save your work, and obviously you can do that. But on my tablet, I've set the top left button to uh, Control S. So all I need to do when I want to save my work is just press that top button and it saves it. So it's even quicker. Uh, also, if you're ever recording your work, set one of the, um, the buttons to the keybind that will start and stop your recording. So you can quickly press it and uh, it just makes things quicker. Uh, right, another thing I was going to do is just save this uh, layer. Um, and uh, so I've I've duplicated what I've done tonight so far, and I've saved that and put it in a in a folder. Because what I like to do is then I'll work on, continue to work on it and then I can then show the sketch, which is that. Um, then I can show this stage and then I can show the next stage and then the next stage. Uh, so it's going going quite well, actually. Um, he says, relieved. So um, uh, what should we do? Should we work on that one? Or the top one. Uh, that's quite zoomed in, isn't it? Is that going to still fit? It will, won't it? Uh, <laughs> Just at the Dude. is that no? I kind of just want to have both of them on the same, on the screen at once, but at the same time it's a little bit too close. The top, I, mean, I just have to go with it really. That's better. Get it in the middle. 
That'll do. Right, okay, let's uh, get a little bit more refined, shall we? I'm using a pointed brush now. That's because it helps to Get a little bit more precision. But I will actually jump back and forth between a round brush and a pointed brush. And what I'm going to do is just kind of be a little bit more kind of uh, brushy, I guess, or chunky with the brush strokes. Um, because I want to kind of chisel out the light on the top. And then I will probably use one of my blenders to smooth it out a little bit. I don't usually use blenders as like a main uh, workhorse tool in my painting I tend to like to blend with uh, brushes rather than blenders because I like to maintain the the bristles the brush strokes but since making my own brushes and my own blenders. Uh, I have made some blender brushes that uh, maintain that texture so they won't kind of completely blur everything out and make it look sort of plastic.
too much right around here than I've painted. These brushes are, they're the smooth brushes in my brush pack, but they are very blendy and wet. So they will kind of push paint around intentionally to uh, make it look like wet oil paint. So there isn't as much control with them. Again, intentionally, because I don't want to be like super precise so because if you have if the brushes are what well, I found having made my own I find that if your brushes are allow you to be like surgical in your precision then there is a chance that you will overwork something whereas if the brushes kind of fight you a little bit and kind of prevent you from getting too detailed too quickly then that can be of a benefit because it kind of resists you and Reminds you, don't get too detailed. Don't get too detailed yet, you know? Which has always been uh, an issue with my past work where I would get really detailed too quickly and uh, kind of lose sight of broader brush strokes and that sort of thing and maintaining that uh, bristly, textury goodness that you get from traditional work. Like I said earlier, I like to try and celebrate the fact that it is hand-drawn. Starting to chip away at some of the details, but uh, more will be done with thicker brushes later on. Particularly with the the lines in the finger, you know the, the wrinkles and creases. Could 
do some of those with liner brush. But uh, again, probably going to end up being too too fiddly at this stage. It's really annoying me though. It's a really interesting little kind of wrinkle in the finger. It's catching the light and I can't get it right. <laughs> One of those details that if you can put it off then it really helps to make a painting look more effective and realistic. It's details like that, it's like I was saying earlier when it's about capturing realism, it's not about um, how smooth or refined all your brushwork is it's the, the tonal value it's the the color choice um and it's also those little sort of unique details and characteristics that help sell sell the idea be brighter up there. Across here. You can also exaggerate colours if you want to. You know, you can make them stronger. Like there's a little bit of pale light going along the top here and uh, I've just made it a slightly stronger uh, sort of pale blue green
uh, I'm going to use a little flat brush, I think, to do that little wedge there. Again, like I was saying, use the use a large brush, use the right brush for the job, sort of thing. Um, It's just something about that shape there that lends itself well to um, this is square brush. Kind of like your your carving, you're carving the the paint, you're carving the shapes out. Also, I'm just going to add the highlight or some of the lighter tone along the top here, but uh, also following the lines of the, the contour. So. As the, the skin and the muscle stretches over, it's heading in this direction, so I'm brushing in that direction. Still using a flat brush. A little bit smaller. Basically, like brush efficiency, you're trying to use as few as fewer brush strokes as you can. Which isn't easy. Um, because it, it sort of implies that, you know, an expressive um, method, really when really it's been created very carefully you've you've chosen the right brush for the job and uh but it's made to kind of look like it you know happened by accident almost which is where the life and the energy come from really from um you know, you don't want to over-render everything to such a point that all of the life is just sucked out of your, your, your image. And that's true of painting or drawing. That's what I used to do. And uh, whilst my paintings were detailed, some of the life, you know, was quite literally rendered out of it and uh, that was always frustrating. Use my flat brush again. The uh, bristles in the brush are helpful as well because uh, you look at your fingers, you, you have sort of lines that go that way across the width of the finger rather than along the length. So, like I was saying earlier about following the contours of the anatomy, but also, you know, having those, oh, 
Having those lines there kind of helps to add some texture. Some sort of wrinkle. Do I prefer pen tablets or tablets with a screen? So um, I mentioned earlier that I've got a Huion Canvas Pro 24, which um, isn't like the super expensive one. I used to have a Cintiq. Um, again, that wasn't a super expensive one, but um, where's my and being weird. Um, I've clicked something. Sorry, uh, let me just answer your question. Um, do I have a preference? Uh, I've used a, a screen tablet for a very long time. Um, and uh, I don't know if I would go back necessarily because I like having the, the artwork right there underneath the, the pen. Uh, however, I used a, a more you know, standard tablet with no screen um, for a long time beforehand. And uh, I know that there are many pro artists out there that work in the industry with that, that use a tiny little kind of uh, Wacom bamboo tablet or you know a, a small a small tablet because they travel with it or whatever it would be and and uh, they produce fantastic work with it so it's it's not really about um, uh, what tool you're using it's whatever is uh, works for you um, but uh, I I certainly, I would certainly miss not having the screen, um, but I know that if I had to, if I had to go and go and have uh, use a, a screenless tablet, then I would be able to adapt and get back to sort of using it. Um, but uh, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't know enough about them or to really say. You know that one is better than the other. Uh, one is certainly more expensive than the other. So I think it depends really that the pro in terms of pro and con, it's more to do with the cost and also whether you have enough space to have it on your desk. Like if you're going to be traveling a lot, then maybe getting a huge uh, screen tablet isn't going to be the best idea because obviously uh, you're not going to be traveling with that um, far too expensive and heavy. Whereas a smaller, you know, pocket-sized tablet almost that can go in a backpack um, would be much, uh, you know, a better idea for you. Um, so uh, it's again preference. Now let me figure out what I have done. Why have I? I've pressed something. <laughs> oh, there we go. That was weird. I'd pressed something that had swapped my tool to something else and I'm not quite sure what I pressed it was when I drank some water I must have knocked some But uh, yeah, referring to your uh, XP pen, I've I've heard good things. Um, I don't necessarily know all of the details because uh, I'm quite happy with my eye on. I am quite envious of the 
the huge Cintiqs though, because they have the, the super fancy one has a an art pen which has rotation uh, and tilt. So normally the pens only have tilt, so it's like it only re registered this. But the art pen in the super fancy Wacom Intros, whatever it is, didn't he? Uh, will react to twisting as well, um, which means that you can obviously use your hand and rotate and tilt, and you would be able to get a really beautiful uh, twisting um, brush stroke, which would certainly help with trying to be more painterly. Uh, so I'm kind of envious of all that and would like to get one eventually, but they're super expensive. Yeah, I'm using the Canvas Pro 24. I forget when I got it. I think it was um, 2002, 2001. What I will say is um, when I had my Cintiq, my Wacom Cintiq, the reason that I got rid of it was because I annihilated the screen uh, because I, I push quite hard when I'm painting um, and I basically chiseled my way into it, into the screen um, because it had a plastic screen um, which I found difficult to remove um, I did manage to re remove it, but not until after I'd bought, a, bought the Huion as a replacement because it was cheaper. And I thought, oh, well, you know, can't afford to get another Cintiq right now, so I'll get a Huion, which was like half the price, if that. Um, so, because I was doing a commission at the time, so I couldn't be without a tablet. Um, and yes, I could have got a, a a standard tablet without a screen. Yes, I could have done that, but I had enough to replace it with um, get a, a, another cheaper screen tablet, which was the Hawaii on canvas. Um, and I think there was money off at the time as well, so I kind of jumped on it. But uh, the point is that this Hawaii on has kept going because it's got a glass screen. So, I can't chisel into it in the same way. If I were to get another tablet, it would have to be a glass screen. So that's one of the criteria I always look for. If you want your, t your tablet to be durable, get one with a glass screen. Um, either that or have a very, very light touch. Otherwise, you will carve into it like I did. But uh, that's not um, exclusive to uh, screen tablets. That will also happen on standard tablets as well. I uh, I used to have a, like I said, a, a standard tablet, and that was plastic, and I chiselled into that one too. So uh, something to think about. I'm liking the uh, I'm liking the colour balance I've got so far with the sort of the warm and the, the warm oranges and the blues and the 
the green. And that's largely due to the fact that I've got the blue background. Because all of the blue that you see on the hands is coming through from the background, so... If I'd used a warmer background, it wouldn't have had this this effect. I'd have had to have painted it in. So. following the contours again. This is a threads brush, smooth threads brush from my brush set. It's a, a nice brush because it's kind of... Oh, you can't see it. <laughs> um, it's like a an uneven... sparse type brush that helps to add little bits of texture and you know, more random painterly way. Whereas I've also got a rake brush as well, which is more standard, uh, you know, uniform rake. So yeah, if you want to break some of the monotonous areas, you can just use a brush with a bit of texture on it and a wonky bristle. It helps add a bit of character. And also because the skin has got the, uh, and the muscles and the wrinkles are all kind of stretched in this direction. Having these lines helps to bring that some of that te texture without it looking overdone. Some more green down here.
wanted to lighten up the underside of the fingers here because I left it a little bit too dark and kind of forgotten to add in the sort of darker mid-tone. It's, uh, it's not a vein, it's a tendon, I think. Where they uh, on the back of the hands. It's uh, stronger, it's catching the light more than I've captured it so far. So let's lighten that up. This is the part of the painting that I, I enjoy most, I would say. It's when you've got the base done and then you can start to kind of find this, the more subtle, nuancy changes in, in colour and details and, and the more... Like this bit that I was talking about earlier where it's a little kind of a unique bit of the anatomy that you can depict and it helps to bring it bring it alive make it come to life more A bit more red under here. Not quite so green as I've got it. And this bit, another. This is another one of those little subtle details that to get a pointed brush. It's where the webbing of the finger from the larger one here goes across and attaches to the small pinky finger. And it's just catching some of the light and uh, subsurface scattering where it's because it's thin the skin is thin there and uh, the light is shining through and it's got a nice orange glow probably a little bit a little bit strong there Save my work. see how uh, the lighting wouldn't the highlights wouldn't be as 
dramatic or as striking as they are if we hadn't done all of that sort of darker shadow work before. You know, even though the highlights and the orange heat is going to be the most exciting part. Keeping away from it for as long as possible. <laughs> and, uh, you know, not getting carried away too quickly. It's really helping to sell the idea now. You have to have patience. Do I have to keep telling myself? <laughs> yeah, hands are difficult. Um, but it's also because they are so expressive as well. So, you know, you can... You can have a... Be drawing a character. And you can paint the most beautiful hands on this character. And... You might have to get rid of them because they you the the emotion that they are conveying isn't right uh, for the character or the story you know the the narrative that you're trying to tell the gesture um, so it's more than just anatomy hands is more than are more than just anatomy uh, it's a uh, They have a, an agenda all of their own. 